We would like to welcome you to the Cambridge School of Art and, uh, and Anglia Ruskin University and to the wonderful e evening with Donna Ferrato and Laura Panak. It is a great honor to have these two amazing photographers with us tonight. For the people who are joining us from other parts of the world and are not familiar with Cambridge and the Art School, I would like to draw a mental sketch for you to set the scene. The Cambridge School of Art is located in the centre of Cambridge uh, on the East Road campus at Angli uh, of Anglia Ruskin University. The original sc uh, School of Art was opened in 1858 and the, um, is therefore the oldest part of the modern Anglia Ruskin University. It, it, it is housed in a characterful red brick building with light filled studios that smell of paint and photographic chemicals. In better times, the Ruskin Gallery exhibitions are at the centre of the campus where uh, our students and visitors meet and we uh, can't wait to welcome you all again in person for one of the many exciting events we have planned in the future. The Cambridge School of Art annual photography lecture um, brings together a high profile British and international photographers uh, uh, every year and we invite the Cambridge public to join us for an insightful for insightful talks about uh, by outstanding photographers. Some of our previous speakers are in the audience tonight. I would like to give a special welcome to Jane Hilton and Anthony Lovera. Thank you for joining us. Before I introduce our guests, I would like to also welcome uh, Joe McCulloch our new head of Cambridge School of Art. He has started officially working with us today and we would like to welcome Joe to our Cambridge Art community. Just a few brief housekeeping rules. In case disaster strikes and we get disconnected, we will make sure that we reschedule the talk. A talk. First of all, try to log, in, log back in 10 minutes later and hopefully we are back online. Hopefully nothing will happen at all and we're going to just smoothly go through the event. If you have any questions, please add them to the chat. My colleague Duncan Ganley will keep an eye on the chat and will pick out themes that are emerging and we can explore it in the conversation after the presentations. If you have any individual comments or feedback, please feel free to email me. I will be looking at your messages after the event and will get back to you as soon as possible. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our two speakers tonight who are kindly agreed to speak for us, um, speak to us about their careers, their passions and ambitions. Both of them will speak about 35 to 40 minutes before we open up the conversation. Our first speaker will be Donna Ferrato, who is joining us from New York today, um, where it's only lunchtime. It is a great privilege and honor to welcome Donna to this talk, whose fearlessness and guts has inspired me throughout my photographic career. Um, Donna Ferrato is an inspire, uh, international acclaimed photojournalist who, who known for her groundbreaking documentation of the hidden world of domestic violence. Her seminal book, Living with the Enemy, published in 1991, had four editions and, a long, um, and alongside exhibition and lectures across the globe sparked a national discussion on sexual violence and women's rights. In 2014, Ferrato or Donna launched uh, uh, the I Am Unbeatable uh, campaign, a campaign and exposed, documented and prevent um, and prevent document violence against women and children uh, through real stories of real people. Donna has uh, contributed uh, to amongst every major newspaper uh, and publication in the US and her uh, photographs have appeared in nearly 500 solo exhibitions in museums and galleries worldwide. She has been a member of the executive board of directors of the W. Eugene Smith Fund and was president and founder of the non-profit domestic abuse awareness project. 
She has been a recipient of the W. Eugene Smith Grant, the Robert F. Kennedy Award for Outstanding Coverage of the Plight of the Disadvantaged, the IWMF Courage of Photojournalist uh, uh, Journalism Award, the Missouri Medal of Honor of Distinguished Service in, in Journalism, Artist of the Year of the Tribeca um, Film Festival, and the Look 3 Inside Art, uh, Artist of the Year. In 2008, the city of New York proclaimed Don, uh, October the 30th, Donna Ferrato Appreciation Day. And in 2009, she was honored by the judges of New York State Supreme Court for her work um, advancing gender equality. In 2020, uh, Donna was chosen as one of the 100 heroines uh, by the British charity 100 Heroines, who help uh, harness the heroic voices um, to bring about better representation of women in cultural programming. Her new uh, book, Holy, published in uh, 2019 uh, by uh, Powerhouse book, uh, Books, is uh, is a call to action. It proclaims the sanct uh, sanctness of women's rights and their power to be master of their own destiny. Over to you, Donna. It's an honor for me and, and my pal Houdini. This is a really important discussion we're going to have with Laura and she's honored to be able to show my work with you. And I really appreciate the invitation. This is beautiful. So Aristotle warned that inequality brings instability. Plato believed that demagogues exploited free speech and installed themselves as tyrants. Looking back over my career, I would say that much of it has been concerned with the problem of tyranny over women and slaves in the American society. The photographs that are on the screen right now, let's hold on it just for, was this the first image? I believe it is of the story of Lisa and Banks. I, her real name is Elizabeth and she's come forward now for a lengthy interview that we did together for Time Magazine back in 2015. Um, when Time Magazine was working on an issue about the 100 most impactful photographs, the one in history, in the history of photography, this one that involved Elizabeth in the bathroom with her husband banked um, is the, the photograph that was chosen. And indeed, it, it this is Elizabeth when I first met her in the early days with her husband Banks, and he was a very, very wealthy, brilliant entrepreneur programmer. And that was his company right there, Betacom. He'd made millions of dollars with this, with his uh, knowledge about software. And when I first met them, I wanted to do a story about them because I thought this woman was so empowered and I believed that her husband respected her and and wanted her to be happy. But, you know, the method, the way that I work is not to just make any assessments about their lives or think that I know them very well from just meeting them, just being invited to their house or seeing them with friends. My method is to completely submerge myself in their worlds, to forget about what my life is all about and be with them, living with them. And I've, I've done this since, since the 70s, since I first had a camera in my hand. I left my home, I left my friends, I left my country to be out in the world with complete strangers and live with them. So from those early years was how I was able to apply this, this process of working and getting to know people through living with this family, Elizabeth and Banked. Um, and okay, we can go to the next picture. 
you know, I was attracted to them because they were very sexually free. So I, but you know, I was, I'm a product of the sixties. Um, I believe in free sex, free love, free women, free men, free people. I don't, I, and I was, I was a failure as a wife. So I, and to a man that I truly love, but I was just a, abysmal failure. So I decided that I would find other people to be around to people who seem to love each other. And this was the couple that I chose. I did meet them at Plato's Retreat, which was a club for swingers. It was the first of its kind back in the um, late 70s when swinging was a very big thing, when there was no fear about sex, when there was no fear about cocaine. There was no fear until the 80s and until AIDS happened. So, so you know, this was my process in those early days was to be fearless and to be with people who I thought were fearless as well. Um, let's, so, I'm, so there they are. This is Elizabeth and her husband Banked um, when I first met them at Plato's Retreat. I wanted to tell their story because I didn't see that there was jealousy. I didn't see Banked as someone who wanted to control his wife. She was very intelligent. She had had five children already, if you can believe that. Um, she was very smart, educated, but she, she was also very happy to be a housewife and to take care of her children and to hopefully be with her husband um, so that he could do his work. You know, it was very traditional in that way. He worked and she took care of the family. Both were Swedes, uh, Swedish immigrants. Okay, let's go to the next picture, please. So this is their lifestyle. This is this is what I was trying to show, and I was working for a J uh, Japanese playboy at the time, um, who was interested in the story of couples who had it all and were um, freewheeling and sexually uninhibited and. So this was the, this is their daily life. There's Elizabeth on one hand, the nanny for the five children in the middle, and banked on the other side. Uh, it was a pretty good life. Swimming pools, his and her Ferraris. They lived in a mansion right next door to Richard Nixon. They had it all. And I thought it was going to be a very happy, hot, sexy little story. I, I didn't know where I was going with it. And I have to tell you all, that's kind of also my method. I, I never know where I'm going. I don't control anything. I don't have any preconceived notions about anything. I'm along for the ride. That's why I'm a photographer. That's why I do so well just bouncing around out in the world. I love people. I want to see what they're all about. Um, next picture, please. This was the night that took me totally by surprise, but I had had a suspicion things were happening because I'm, you know, I would go and visit this couple for sometimes weeks at a time, but I had been away from them. I, I had just had a baby. My little baby was, you know, only like a few months old, six months old, and she was sleeping with me down the hall when I heard screaming coming from their end of the house. And I put the baby Fanny in the closet and went running. Of course, I took my camera because my camera, my camera is me. I walk with my camera. I sleep with my camera. I even talk with my camera. So I grabbed that camera and I went running down into their master bathroom. And there, this was the second. I only had one roll of film with me, and that's significant. So. I, I I took this picture, I was going in and I saw he was going to hit his wife. I didn't know what was happening, but as I took that picture, I was thinking, I have to get this picture because this is the only proof that I could ever have that he would be this kind of a man. I Then I, when he went to hit her again, I grabbed his arm and I said, what the fuck are you doing? You are going to hurt her. And he threw me down and he said, look at she's my wife. And I know she's lying and I have to teach her that she can't lie to me. Like this was all just like, I don't know if any of you can imagine what it was like to be in this house that night, seeing like the shining nightmare of all times happening in front of your eyes. But listen, listen, I want people to listen and understand. 
I am a photographer. I am not a policewoman. I am not a judge. I am, my job is to simply be there and see what's happening. When he went to hit her again, I grabbed his arm, of course, and he didn't hit her again, but he proceeded to do all these other inhumanities to her, shouting at her like she was an animal, threatening to blow everything up. And yes, I kept taking pictures slowly, slowly, because I only had one roll of film. That one roll of film, I don't know how long that, that nightmare was unfolding, but it took me right up to the point where he found the drugs that he was searching for. That's why he was so mad at her, because she was trying to get rid of the drugs. She, she knew they were ruining her and her husband, and, and so he was, he was tor terrorizing her because he was the tyrant in that house and she had disobeyed him. So, so the, the, that roll of film took me to the very end where he found the drugs, threw them in the fireplace, held up his own stash and said, I never needed these. I just had to prove to you, you couldn't get away with lying to me. Okay, so that's the story of Elizabeth and Banked. But it doesn't end there, folks. I mean, I kept living with this family off and on for many years. When she left him, and she left him soon after, I followed her to, she was in a shelter, she had help from friends, then she got her own house, and she took care of her kids without this man, who went on to have a very nice second life with the woman who supported him. Um, but Elizabeth became the rock of Gibraltar for her family, because she took care of her and her children totally on her own. Let's go to the next picture. You see, this was what was so outrageous. I'm following her through all parts of her life when he, but I, but I had already seen him beat her. So then, so then when I went to visit her a second time, many months later, and, and Banks said that he had just had her committed to a hospital because she was an alcoholic and she had gotten drunk one night and fallen down and hit her head. I said, I want to go with you. I want to see her. And there she was with a fresh black eye. And so I realized this was real, what I had seen. I tried to deny it for a long time. And it's important for people to understand how denial works. And I'm ashamed of it that I was, in, even though I had seen her being beaten, I didn't want to believe in that until I saw this moment in the, um, it was a, you know, a detox center where he had put her. And then I started to understand how the whole thing works, the whole thing around domestic violence and about coercive control and psychological control and the way tyrants work. Um, this, just keep going, next picture. You know, she was drinking all the time just to maintain her sanity in, in being in this relationship. Go ahead. Okay, so here's Elizabeth now some over 30, close to 40 years later, still with me. Uh, nobody else, no crazy violent husband, no mean, he's dead now. Um, she's on her own. She is the, the, the rock of Gibraltar of the family. And that's why, to me, Elizabeth is, you know, she, she's the woman that every woman can be. I know that. I know that she embodies all the courage and the strength and the determination that every woman has in her to overcome tyranny. These are her with her five children, all grown. Um, this is what makes Elizabeth so strong. She lives for these incredible children. Um, yeah, and they they live for her too. Here she is, I took her at it, you know, I just, this is kind of, I know I'm taking up a lot of time with this story, but you have to understand the way I work also is I get inflamed. I become obsessed, you know, it's just the way my mind functions. So when I was very young, like back in the 90s, early 90s, I saw that Hillary was, you know, Bill was running for president and 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 uh, Hillary was being auctioned off. Um, lunch with Hillary uh, was being auctioned off. This was before she lived and before Bill became president. but. I figured I needed to talk to Hillary. 
to talk to her about domestic violence, and I believed that they were going to win. So I paid $4,500 for Hillary Clinton at a child care auction campaign just to win the chance to talk to her about domestic violence. And I, and I, I, I won her. I won her. And so I took Elizabeth and eight other strong women who were leaders in the domestic violence world to meet Hillary on the day of the inauguration. It was a very peaceful inauguration. There were no insurrections. And, um, and it was fantastic to see Elizabeth meeting with Hillary and having Hillary sign her book, Living with the Enemy. That was a, a great day. Okay, so let's keep going. This is the story of Sarah, Sarah Augusta. And Sarah was 12 years old when um, the man that she was to have two amazing children with um, snuck into her bedroom to have sex with her and got her pregnant. She was actually, she was 13 when she got pregnant. Um, but this is who she was. This is, let's go to the next picture. This is Sarah today after she left him, left this abusive man who had dominated and controlled her life since she was 12 years old. And she had two children with him that were extremely important to her, two beautiful sons. And so because she knew that this man was going to kill her, I mean, it was clear what he was getting ready to do. She ran. She ran and she took her children with her. And it was a terrifying period for her. And I lived with her. This was in Tennessee. I lived with her off and on for three years. Let, let's keep going. Uh, this is Sarah today. Um, not today. This was we, These pictures were made back between 2012 and 2015. But she became my first um, symbol of the I am unbeatable woman. Let's keep going. Um, and it's never, it's not smooth or easy to leave an abuser. It's scary. It's really hard. And you think you're going to die every minute of the day after you leave. You feel more vulnerable and terrified than ever. And it was really, really difficult for Sarah because her abuser was capable of everything. Um, she found the love of a good man. Um, she found a good man to love, I should say. She found a very good man who also has been a wonderful father to her two sons. And, and you know, this, these pictures were made over a very long period of time, but even going into people's rooms and watching them when they sleep is something that I do. I like to do. I like to see people when they are happy, at peace, loving. Um, my purpose in life is not to go around seeing people getting hurt or being abusive. Um, I, I, I want to change all of that. Please keep going. So I'm always looking for people who are more healing, who help each other, who help each other to get through horrible times together. Um, please, next picture. Sarah's an amazing healer. She's an amazing, strong mother who's raised these two beautiful young men that I'm so close to, even today. And they, they are, they're so aware and educated about the inequality between men and women. And they are working, both of themselves, to change that. They are examples of the kind of young men that we can raise when we we get out of these tyrannical relationships. Let's go to the next picture. Um, here they are in their home uh, right before they, they had to get out of this home because the ex was circling with his father all the time and threatening to kill them. And so they, they eventually moved out of this house where they really weren't safe. Um, Please go, keep going. Um, this was at an event, um, Meet Me at the Bridge in Nashville, Tennessee, that happens every year where survivors of domestic violence come and they share their experiences. And it's, it's very, it's, it, it's an important ritual, ritualistic ceremony every year, um, which happens all over the country every year. Um, many cities do this. There's profound understanding of the importance of survivors coming together and talking about the ones that 
they love, who maybe were murdered or how they survived and helping each other. It is all about healing and holding each other up. And this is the story. This is what the story that I did about Sarah um, and worked on for those three years. That this would became the very big, um, you know, this great poster where Sarah became, you know, the 20 foot tall woman on the side of Vanderbilt building as the I am unbeatable woman. This was incredible. And her ex came to see this show too. He went through the entire show, which was dedicated to her with the video that was narrated by her sons, as well as by Sarah, and the photographs, which were the photographs from Living with the Enemy and I Am Unbeatable, Sarah Augusta's story. That, that for me, this is one of the proudest moments of my life as a photographer, because I'm all about putting these pictures out into the world so that we can educate more people, more children, more women, more men, to know that they don't have to live that other way, which is negating each other's goodness. We don't want to do that. We don't want to keep pulling each other down. So I, I hope my pictures and everything I do can be used as a call to action, as well as raising money for shelters and for programs, education. That's, that's all it is for me. I don't care about anything else, really. Um, let's go on. Um, these are a few pictures from my new book, Holy. This is basically this Holy is is a statement about how I've seen the world through the eyes of and the lives of so many women and amazing people that I've met over the last 50 years with my camera, especially my mother, my own mother, who was an incredible saint and and my daughter who also is very much like my mother uh, very loyal and um, so the book is very personal because you know what we photographers we're not just made we don't just make ourselves I don't really believe that I think we're made by all the people that we know the people in our families that we grow up with the people that we choose to be our friends and we choose to keep in our lives and then we nourish and we nurture the ones that we feel that we can reveal ourselves with, we can be true with. All these pictures in the book are, I designed the book, I hand wrote it in a way. These are stories of the women from Living with the Enemy, as well as all the other stories, Love and Lust, um, all the stories of like people who live to be sexually free. Those are my, those are as much my guiding lights as, as anybody else in the book. Um, so a woman's journey, that's what the Book of Holy is all about. And every, these are not, these are not conventional captions even. These are my interpretations of captions, maybe as they were first told in magazines and books. Well, I'm telling you these stories now through my heart. I want people to understand the heart of a woman, not in a generic way, not in a socially acceptable way. I think we have to break through all the bullshit, really, because that bullshit, all that religious stuff, all the social conditioning stuff, all the stuff we've been told about women and how women are just supposed to accept everything and women are supposed to accept about not about being invisible. We have to like say enough is enough and keep going. Um, I, you know, these like Margaret Atwood here, I met her in 1986 and I read her book, The Handmaid's Tale. I had to photograph her for a magazine. That book scared the living daylights out of me back in 1986 because I had already seen this, this amazing woman being beaten up in her own home by this tyrant telling, I thought, I realized that there was, I was already understanding domestic violence, living in shelters, riding with the cops, seeing it firsthand what goes on with women, not shying away from any of these truths. And so, so Margaret Atwood became this like 
you know, this big spiritual um, voice in my head all the time. And I was trying to serve her often through the photographs that I was taking about women losing their autonomy, women being told that they couldn't not give birth or they couldn't have an abortion or, you know, strangers making sh women feel ashamed for wanting to have abortions. I, I had to plunge into that whole debate too that was happening. It was erupting in the streets of America all over the country back in the 80s and the 90s. So I plunged into that, please go ahead, keep going. And at the same time, I'm seeing women being put into prison for killing their abusers as they were also having sex with their children and women finding out that the abuser's killing or raping their child she kills him, she goes to prison. And then I also saw how with so many of the courtrooms, the, the father's rights groups were coming to brainwash the family court so that women were no longer being treated with dignity and respect. Oftentimes they were being treated like the enemy. And so this was a female court back in, in Cleveland, Ohio that was receiving great acclaim because it was female centric. Please keep going. This was a photograph that also um, says so much because it says, it talks about how children feel when they're in these situations. And this young boy, Diamond, had such a huge impact on me as well as on the cops. He called the police and said that his father was hurting his mother. And he stood in front of his father as the police were arresting him and taking him out to the to the cop car and he said, I hate you for hitting my mother and don't you ever come back to this house. Now, I have to tell you something. I stayed with this family. I got to know them. I got to know the mother and father. Everybody had to sign releases. You know, the father, the father's not a, not, this is, a, it's not a black and white story here, folks. Um, but he knew he was wrong for threatening his wife and his this the father and the mother were fighting and diamond couldn't take it anymore he was pushed over the edge and i also want to say to you all that you need to people need to understand how the children feel and not just always be talking about the parents but the parents need to really understand how their children feel everybody has to respect the rights of children number one because they truly are trapped. They have nowhere else to go. So I got to know Diamond. I looked him up when he was about 27 years old, spent time with him in, in, uh, in Minneapolis where he was then a hairdresser, a beautiful young man who loved women. He did not become an abuser. Um, and we stayed in touch and I, you know, and his mother and father were still together after all these years. So that, you know, that's important for people to understand too, that many of these photographs have such depth to them. Okay, let's keep going. I don't want to take up too long. I don't want to take up time. These are all very personal stories. Up on the left side is when I had my abor abortion in um, Paris and 1978, and that's a self-portrait. You know, all I knew was I had to be free even though it was, I loved the man and I was a good opportunity to be able to be a photographer and have a child, I was not ready. And everyone has to respect that, that the woman must be ready. It's her womb, it's her body, it's her life. Over here, these are the, these, this is part of a long story that I did for, for uh, Mother Jones. And these are the offending sinks. I, you know, I really hate these sinks, which were, but I won't go into it. You have to read the book, Holy. What I like is Sojourner Truth. I got excited when I saw that truth is powerful and it prevails. Sojourner Truth is one of my, the women that I honor every day. I pray to her and I pray to my mother every single day to give me strength. Next picture. This is from a story that I did for the New York Times Sunday Magazine on all of the children who were being raped um, in Soweto in South Africa back in the in the 90s, in the late mid to late 90s. 
horrific stories, um, just horrific stories. Poor, these women are so strong and the children are incredibly strong too. Um, the, you know, lot, these, these stories, they just don't leave me. And there are three stories that are in the book of Holy. And they're in the book because these children were fierce. I mean, they were made fierce. In South Africa, if a child is, was raped, they had to take the police to where the rapist lived and point him out to the police. That was the only way that a conviction could stand. So these children, they don't really think like children. They, they, their bodies are children, but they've seen things in such a horrific way that it makes them change. And we need, we the adults around them, we need to change too. And what I saw from the women in Soweto was that they were doing that work. They were doing it and honoring their children and standing up to the rapists. These are other wonderful stories that are in Holy. These, both of these women, they, they fell in love way, way back in the early 90s. They got 10 vials of sperm, which they shared between them. This was the first baby that they had, baby Azir, um, incredibly loving couple. And then the next time around, Jay also used the same sperm and had another um, child, a daughter. What's wonderful, one of the many wonderful things is uh, talking to them through the years and knowing how much they love and respect each other. And they've both been able to share all the responsibilities and the joys of being mothers together for three decades. I mean, that's that's what it's all about. Um, please keep going to the next pictures. I don't, it's my daughter here. This is a really important picture because this is where I'm able to kind of make a point of saying that Fanny felt the pull, despite the, the pull to religion, because of all of the icons that were around my grandmother's house and the statues and all the religious saucity, which Philip Jones Griffiths, her father, did not encourage, nor did I. Because in my eyes, the church is a thief, stealing women's autonomy and exploiting children's innocence. The proof is in the designation of power in the Holy Trinity. And that's what holy is all about. The mother, the daughter, and the other. So that's that's uh, that's that's my mission now through this book of holy, is to kind of shake things up a little bit, and like really bring women out of the shadows. Um, you know, women have been too nice about it for a very long time, and I'm hoping that this book is not just a call to action to get out and vote, but for women to really stand up for their spirits. And I don't say become like a loud mouth bore and say that you're like, you know, perfect and genius and or be like a narcissist, like these a lot of these political leaders, but just feel good about yourself. Feel confident. Don't let people pull you down. Don't let anybody diminish you. That's what this book is supposed to be about. And that's what I'm trying to show through the lives of myself and my family and incredible women that I've met over the last 50 years. Boom. I don't know if we have any more pictures after that. I don't think so. Um, this is my mother who was the good wife for 70 years. Uh, my, this is my father behind her who has just died. He was a chest surgeon. He was a brilliant man. He was really my hero for so, so much of my life because he was so funny and brilliant and kind, but he wasn't, he wasn't a good husband. And he really betrayed my mother again and again and again. And she, you know, he also was bipolar. Uh, this is, this is my grandson. This is my... Hey guys. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> this came back from the supermarket. Okay, thank you. I love you. Okay, so, so 
but so his death was was very sad for me but i was amazed to see how my mother was just ready she had taken care of him for so long she was ready to get on with her life and i respect her she right away he had just died and she was doing what she always did come on queenie come on queenie you get you get this room cleaned up you put all of those things away come on we're gonna you know this this had happened in a veteran's home far away from where we live so we were gonna have to drive back so she was just like come on she and i didn't realize that she wanted to be free so i paired that with this picture of myself on the right this is a self-portrait that i made um back in 1976 when i knew i was just gonna start to be a photographer so i had to summon up all like you know the powers and i wanted to be an old woman i didn't want to be a young girl because i really felt like nobody took young girls very seriously so i you know i put i went into my mother's bathroom and locked the door put powder in my hair and took this selfie um a, a roll of selfies you know and then i went on my way and then i didn't look at this film for about 20 years and to my surprise when i finally saw the roll and the frame on the roll, there were these bolts coming out of my head that had been made by Fixer that probably hadn't washed off or whatever. But, you know, that's what a that's what a person who's an atheist or an agnostic would say. But I'm actually, you know, once you're, you know, the, I'm still that Catholic girl. You know, it's hard to boot it out. I tried everything. I tried Judaism. I, you know, I've tried everything. But you know i believe that those bolts coming out of my head came from my rage at how women are treated and what i was seeing and what i was photographing and that's why i had to do the book of holy because i had to get out all this anger i had to say something that was really from my heart you know it's like after all these years i had to get to i had to get into my own heart and into my own head and be more honest so okay go ahead i think we need to stop here with these pictures that's good thank, thank you. you thank you so much donna it's absolutely your energy is addictive um and y yeah and i think everybody who kind of just listened to you is inspired and i can't wait to received the book i've ordered it so if you haven't ordered the book yet then please go and go to donna's website uh you can get a signed copy there um thank you but, <laughs> welcome um and if you have any questions for donna uh we have opened up the q a so if you put uh, your questions in here we all uh, we will also obviously li uh, listen to Laura now next, but we, uh, if you have questions just for Donna, feel free to do it, uh, to put them on already in the chat, in the Q&A, um, and then we can um, identify the ones that might also um, cover both of their talks. So you might also want to wait till you also heard Laura's talk and we find some uh, joint questions that are um, relevant for both of the photographers we have with us today. So thank you, Donna. So I'm going to go over to Laura now. Um, and uh, Laura uh, is uh, London based. Um, she's an award winning photographer as well. Renowned, renowned for her recognizable portrait, uh, portraiture and social documentary artwork. Um, she often seeks to explore the complex relationship between subject and photographer, and she heavily focuses on the theme of youth. She was educated at the University of Brighton, Central St. Martins and LCP. Uh, Laura's work has been extensive, extensively exhibited uh, throughout the UK and abroad, including the National Portrait Gallery, Somerset House, the Royal Festival Hall and the Houses of Parliament. Driven by research-led and self-initiated uh, projects, uh, Laura seeks to full, uh, fully understand the lives of those she captures on film in order to portray them as truthfully as possible. 
perceiving time, trust and understanding to be the key elements to achieve this. Many of her projects develop over several years, helping her achieve a genuine connection between herself and her sitter and allow her to capture the intimacy, sharing ideas and shared experiences of this relationship. Laura chooses to shoot with analog film on her personal projects. Uh, by using traditional methods of working from negatives, as well as shooting po uh, Polaroids, she finds beauty in the mistakes that come from working with the unpredictable material. Her artwork has received much acclaim and won numerous awards, some uh, among which um, are the John Coble Award, uh, the Vic Oden Award uh, Prize, the World Press Award, um, uh, sorry, World Photo Press Awards, um, and the HSBC Prix de la Photographie Prize. Just 10 days ago, she won bronze at the Tokyo International Photo uh, Awards in the category for people and culture with a beautiful series about the 16 year old uh, Baruch uh, who chose to leave his Orthodox Jewish community to study at university. In addition to her own practice, uh, Laura uh, lectures, critiques and teaches at university, workshops and festivals around the world and in 2015 judged the portrait category, category of the World Photo Press Awards in Amsterdam. Laura has been also widely published both commercially and, uh, photo, um, and as a photographic artist uh, with her work appearing in the British Journal of Photography, Hot Shoe International, Times, Time, the, uh, the Guardian Weekend, The Telegraph, The Sunday Times and Creative Review. Her monograph Against the Dying uh, of the Light was published by Act de Sud in uh, 2016 and Youth Volume 1 was released in 2018 by Polite Company. Over to you, Laura. Um, thank you so much, Kirsten, and thank you everyone for um, having me. It's a real honour and uh, I'm kind of annoyed that I had to follow Donna because that, <laughs> that was amazing. Um, so I was thinking of actually doing a runner and just leaving her to it. Um, it was just just to hear how she, um, yeah, she immerses herself in it so beautifully in her, in her practice. And that, that picture of that boy, what was his name? I wrote his name down, uh, uh, Diamond, when he's in there, that was, Oh, mind blowing. Um, very inspirational. So I've got lots of questions for Donna. Um, I'm going to keep mine a little bit more lighthearted with lots of cat gifts um, and just talk a little bit about my process. Um, I guess one thing that um, was kind of discussed was to talk about long term projects. So, um, Chris, if you just want to flip through the slides, just sort of a few seconds each one. So um, I guess predominantly my work does focus on youth and adolescence. Um, I tried lots of different things and for me portraiture, um, it just seduced me in a way that no other kind of type of photography did. Um, I love that relationship between the person that I'm photographing and myself and, and that precious and absolutely uh, unique moment when you're when you're taking a picture um, and you're sharing that experience with somebody it's so beautiful um, I kind of uh, work on a number of different projects and um, I what I've done is in this sort of presentation I've divided it into the two ways that I deal with um, kind of my I guess my process and how I photograph um, so if we can just keep going through the slides so one thing I think that um, Kirsten and I talked about discussing was the idea of how we build connectivity. Um, one thing that Donna does so well, which I'm completely in awe of, is, is just by giving people a voice and speaking about such important things. And I think that uh, the best way to do that is to form a connection with somebody. And, um, and I guess that's why when you live with people and you really immerse yourself into the practice, um, it's just it becomes a very unique relationship that's formed. Um, and I think the fact that the camera can transport you into that experience is is pretty magic. Um, so if we just go on to the next slide. So this is a kind of perfect diagram 
to I guess kind of like a summarize my brain um, I kind of worry about what I'm going to do what I'm going to photograph if it's worth photographing you know could I be doing something better um, and have sort of crazy anxiety about things and then when I'm in the process and I'm I'm photographing somebody or even if I'm just sort of spending time with somebody um, and, and sharing that experience with them I'm just completely zoned out and I'm in it and I think photography for me has that power to just channel me into a different world where nothing else matters um, but what often happens is the next slide is um, if we can move on Chris yeah um, I end up sort of kind of stuck and going around in circles and not really kind of like getting the image that I want or um, capturing what I want to display or, or connecting with somebody in the right way um, so I deal with that in two different ways just kind of as a way to learn um, so if we just move on uh, the first is kind of play and experimentation um, and for me um, I guess I think of these as single images so these could just be going out on a walk and you know engaging with a stranger or it could be um, making a game for myself where um, you know I write down L's and R's and when I get to the end of the road I have to turn left or right according to the piece of paper and that for me is just about practice and it's about pushing kind of the boundaries of the photographic medium um, and going back to you know what I love which is the craft of photography it's, it's the magic of seeing the print come you know from under the chemicals it's it's getting my head around all the chemistry and, and the way that, you know, light hits the film and you're like, how does this even work? Um, and also it encourages me to forget this, I guess, um, it, it's a bit of a, a pressure to produce a project and for something to be incredibly um, impactful. And immersing myself in the craft is just a reminder that actually those beautiful little moments um, is you know are all part of this they're all part of the experience so I'm just going to flip through if you just spend five seconds on each image Chris just going through these are just kind of some examples of I work predominantly with an analog film and for me it's about um, pushing the process this was a lovely collaboration with Rhiannon and Adam um, so collaborations are also another thing as well and working with new mediums trying out different cameras different techniques um, I think I just need to remind myself kind of why I love that process and why actually sometimes giving in to the fact that you can't control everything can often produce really beautiful um, mistakes, I guess, and then you learn from those mistakes. Um, and also, I guess the power of the still image for me, um, although I love moving image and I love watching film, a still image for me is just the subjectivity of it and the way that everyone can, I guess, engage with it in a very personal sense and then take away their own narrative um, is, is really why I love photography. Um, so then this is the other kind, um, which uh, I guess Donna can probably relate to a little bit more. Yeah, so this is more kind of long term projects. Um, and I guess for me, uh, most of my projects don't really have a time frame unless it's a commission or a brief. And it's just about, um, I guess, really prioritizing the relationship before the actual final image. Um, so if we just move on, Chris. So a lot of that for me comes from inspiration as well. So I have these little folders on my desktop and this is the very opposite approach to um, the former kind of play. It's more about planning and it's being sort of really strategic in the way that I'm looking at things and making sure that I have all the tools in place to have the best opportunities possible um, to meet the people that I want to meet, find the locations that I want to find um, and just roam and explore. Um, within the confines of guess, I guess a project or an idea. Um, so if we just move on to the next one um, <laughs> and the next one. So um, yeah, for me, this this can be sort of like quite a fun part of the process because I really am aware, especially when I'm doing stories in other communities in other countries or just in general, whenever I'm taking a picture, I'm so hyper aware of the responsibility that I, I don't have the right to tell anyone's story or present them in a way. Um, you know, it has to be a collaboration and it has to be, you know, my artistic voice, and my creative ideas. Um, you know, merged in with kind of who this person is, how they want to present themselves, what we're trying to say, and it needs to be a fun experience. So for me, I just need to, I guess, honour the fact that, um, you know, I am going into a different environment. I am meeting somebody whose life is completely different from mine um, and to educate myself as much as I can prior to meeting that person or going to that place. 
Uh, if we just move on. So one thing about these projects that I guess a lot of image makers don't really discuss because we're all incredibly passionate is how tenacious you have to be with them. And, and I think a lot of the time, like, I, I have to say, like, I really have to drag myself out to take pictures. And that's a really strange confession, I guess, because I love what I do and photography gives me more joy than anything in the world. But at the end of the day, especially with a long term project, you can always do it tomorrow or you can always do it next week. And for me, I think it's about learning that it's OK to not take pictures and it's OK to, you know, take the process very, very slowly. Um, so if we just move on to the next one. So I'm just going to quickly flip through this. This was kind of the first project for me where I guess production came in and I really learned how to be vulnerable in a situation. And I think the one rule that I live by is that I, just, I try and always be as vulnerable as I can when I'm photographing people, because I think it's really important to display my naivety, to um, make whoever I'm photographing as comfortable as possible, but also for me to just go in with a kind of like, I don't know, you know, what I'm doing, or what I'm photographing. And if I'm nervous, then I hope that I will just be a little bit more open minded. Um, so I decided to start this project for a number of reasons. I've always photographed youth and I'd always been interested in the age of adolescence, but I was also interested in kind of um, the psychology of groups and and sort of social psychology, and but also kind of how these sorts of circumstances would affect groups. Um, so I decided to do this project on young British naturists and it took many years to organise and I met people individually and then I went and photographed them at home and met them at home um, and just talked to them about why they were a naturist, what their background was. And then I organised trips at different naturist sites that I'd gone to stay in myself um, and brought these strangers together. Um, and I wanted to just see what happens when these people come together and they have absolutely you know, no connection with each other other than the fact that they're deciding to be naked, um, you know, on arrival and just meet people and embrace the environment um, and be vulnerable together and share that interest. And it meant that also the people that were coming together had such different stories as to how they'd come to naturism. So if you just flick through a few of the images. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a really important project for me. And, you know, every time that I go into working on on an idea it's really important for me to you can just keep flicking through them um it's really important for me to look at what i want to learn out of this um and 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 just listen and learn as much as i possibly can about the subject matter um, about the people that i'm photographing um about the process in itself about creating imagery even down to the basics of you know with this project i'd never photograph groups and i wanted to think about light and photographing groups so it can be very basic to you know how to actually connect with somebody and 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 that relationship between yourself and the photographer um so yeah, so my rule for this is is kind of be vulnerable, be weird. Um, and and one you know major rule that I have is also to to never lie, you know, about your intentions. Just to be completely honest um, with the projects that I do, I have to be so mindful um, of respecting the people that I'm spending time with. And um, I'll talk about that in the in the next project. But also, um, you know, just being honest with myself about why I'm doing these projects and why I'm taking these pictures. Um, and one thing that I kind of, you know, really um, aspire for more with the ideas that I have moving forward is actually to work on things, you know, like Donna does that that are actually like really kind of like um, starting conversations. You know, that's so important to me, and that's the kind of work that I look at. So, for example, with the Young British Naturists. You know, for the beginning part of the project, a lot of people were saying to me, um, oh, do you, do you like being naked? Do you want to be a naturist? And I'd be completely honest with them and I'd say, I don't think so, but I want to, you know, I want to know what it's like. I want to understand, you know, what draws you to naturism. So it's not pretending to be part of a group. It's not pretending to fit in. Um, it's just and ultimately, I do always feel like an outsider, um, but I guess I just kind of embrace that. Um, so if we just go on to the next one. Um, so I wanted to share this project because um, it's most in line with when I look at Donna's work, I, I feel like I can we can relate to each other in, in the sense of like um, uh, relationships and, and working with women. Um, and for me, I, I started this project about eight years ago 
Um, and I was living in Hackney and I was brought up Jewish, but my parents are atheist, um, but my mother's Jewish. My grandmother was quite traditional um, and I found myself in a very Hasidic Orthodox area. And I I knew that it was also um, I, I, I think. Uh, sorry, I just got a message from Sam. Um, and and I, I knew that I didn't really fit into um, this community, but I also understood part of it because I felt like I had a sense of belonging. My Jewish identity is really important to me. Um, so I started approaching people and sort of saying, you know, asking them questions, asking if I could take their pictures and just asking them about the community. And everyone was incredibly closed and standoffish. And um, I'm always drawn to unattainable things. So uh, it kind of intrigued me further. Um, and what really intrigued me was the women because, you know, I could relate to that a little bit more. Um, so I kept trying for about three years. I joined women's groups um, and just met a number of people. Um, and eventually I became friends with a, a few families in London, in Israel and um, in America. And um, I began working with them for a long time. And I, I can say in eight years, I have like one folder of negs. There's such a small amount of pictures. Um, but actually, I would say that 90% of this project has just been having conversations, having dinners, spending time with these families. So there's one family in particular, if we just go through the images um, that I've worked with throughout the whole time. You can just go to the next ones, Chris. Um, so yeah, so this is a few different families. And then if you just keep going. And again. So just starting with this image, this is Hyla and I um, I met her mother, um, Devorah, in London and um, and we became friends about eight years ago. And what I loved about our connection was how absolutely different our lives were, yet we lived a street away. Um, and um, when I met Devorah, she had um, she she had uh, eight children and um, I had just bought a kitten um, and I was kind of living in Hackney and I was kind of going down the pub and, you know, her, our lives were just so, so different. So for me, it was just I really wanted to kind of like um, embrace these differences. And, and I felt like we had this bond based on those differences as well. And I really wanted to learn about her and, and learn from her. And we've, if you carry on going through the images, um, so these, what, what, I, what I kind of love about these projects is looking at time. So if we look at these two boys on, on either end, um, that's them now. So if we go back to the picture before. So in this picture, they were seven. And then forward, they're now uh, 15. And Devorah just gave birth last night, actually, um, to her 15th child. Um, I can still say that my cat has grown up, but I don't have any more. Um, and and for me, it's it's also really interesting um, to kind of build this friendship with someone and, and build a, a relationship with the children as well. So when I first came into the house, um, you know, despite obviously being um, dressed appropriately, they could tell that I, I wasn't, you know, orthodox and and I was kind of a bit curious. And um, and now, you know, I go in and we play games and we do drawing and we do crafts and cooking. And I feel very much kind of part of that family in a way. And, and I think the fact that I just met this woman on the street and the only thing that brought us together was a camera is a really beautiful thing. Um, so you can just go through the images. And to be honest with you, despite, you know, kind of working on this in the background for eight years, I kind of feel like the pictures will probably just be in a little photo album for them. Um, I haven't even gone through the negatives. Um, I, I think I just do it because, you know, for me, it's it's such a nice way to watch a family grow. And and I've, I've been there for probably about, uh, I think, the, uh, the following day of nearly um, six or seven of her births which has been really nice. So like the day after the child is born. So we, she said to me the other day that we, she's lined them up in order of, uh, of which one is which, because I could never tell. Um, and unfortunately, I can't find my favourite picture, which is her with all their washing. Um, and I always, I said to her like, how do you know whose socks are socks? Um, I just, I, I think the way that um, she manages her family is amazing. Um, and uh, yeah, very happy and healthy kids, very sweet. Um, but I, I would like to work with more of the other families as well, because this is not a project about Devorah. This is just about me connecting with these women. Um, and I guess just capturing like daily life and, and family life. 
Um, yeah, so, um, okay. Um, so if we just go on to the next one, I just wanted to talk really quickly about how ideas develop. Um, for me, I don't really have one set rule and way of working. Um, I never kind of know how I'm going to do something before I do it. I heard Donna say earlier about kind of, these weren't her words, but uh, my words would be kind of, I, a lot of the time I just wing it, you know, I just kind of turn up and, and embrace it and see what happens. And and I think that that is what photography is about. It's about play, isn't it? And it's about responding and letting go of the control. Um, and I think for quite a long time with projects, I tried to like, you know, draw out images and map everything. And what I've learned is that you have to wait until those images come into your head and then sketch them out. And if they don't come, then you just turn up and see what happens. Um, and um, I try and be a bit kinder to myself and just say, oh, I'm just doing a recce every time I turn up somewhere and I don't take a picture. Um, so if we just carry on, um, one thing that like um, Donna talked about was commissions. She was talking about kind of how editorials have brought to light ideas as well. Like I noticed like a lot of her beautiful stories came from like Life magazine and, and places like that. And I think that, um, yeah, commissions have the ability to offer up opportunity. Um, and for me, I was just playing around with this idea of kind of love and like, I would get, I guess the themes that run through my work um, predominantly at the top has to be uh, a level of human emotion and connection um, and, uh, and love comes in and youth. So those kind of things interweave quite a lot. Um, and for me, I wanted to work with couples and I find I was looking at Greek mythology quite a lot. Um, and I was just uh, quite interested in the idea of these two halves coming together or, you know, all, all the different kind of um, myths and stories of why relationships form. And then this opportunity came up to do a project on Brexit, which um, wasn't exactly the most inspiring theme that anyone could throw at me. Um, but I wanted to bring it back to human emotion. You know, I, I think that often with when I'm faced with something that is quite heavy or political, I shy away from it. Um, I don't really feel that I, I kind of have the intellect or, or I have, yeah, enough kind of information to to actively express an opinion on it. And I'd rather kind of treat it as kind of um, an opportunity um, to connect with people through images that will provoke emotion. And for us to, you know, all make our own decisions, but just start those conversations. For me, it's about kind of having a conversation about these things. And I knew that with Brexit, we were kind of just so exhausted and bored of that word um, and everything that was affiliated with it. So I wanted to bring it back to love and relationships because everyone can relate to that. So I concentrated on couples that were being um, forced to separate due to Brexit coming into place. Um, and just hearing that, you know, t families have been torn apart and couples have have you know had to come up come come to these compromises was was really fascinating for me and it kind of uh, it intrigued me to read more into um, the wider stories. Um, okay, if we can just move on. So I just wanted to share. I don't know how much time I've got left, but I just wanted to share a few people that have inspired me along the way as well. Um, so these are just a few people. I mean, there's so so many. Um, so if you just want to start running through them, Chris, um, I guess like. Um, the work that inspires me is um, ranging from, you know, not only eras, but genres and and it inspires me for different reasons. But Jessica Dimmock's work, um, I remember seeing at a university and for me it was it was the way in which she just immerses herself into this land and shows you a world that you that, you know, she's she's just taking you inside with her camera and um, I think what impressed me the most was the level of trust that the, the people that she was working with clearly had uh, when she was working with them. And I don't know how many years it was, but um, for me, what struck me as most impressive was actually towards the end of the film and the project when um, you saw, you know, the individual stories of the people that had left um, this project, the ninth floor, um, where they'd left the building and, you know, they'd had children or they would they were reunited with their families. And it was those it was those journeys that brought to light addiction and abuse and um, and just all the different kind of so many different things that, that come into her work. It normalized everything to the point where, you know, we were able to kind of just bring it back down to the person and just connect with the person that she was photographing. Um, and then moving on, um, I can never pronounce her surname or she's going to hate me, but Darcy Fildub, maybe um, she did this project for I think it was about 30 years. Um, and for me, it was it was just the idea of like, uh, you know, 
no, not really having an agenda when you're making work, but just connecting with one person. Um, if you just go through Chris and uh, and the relationship that she built with his family and um, and how she kind of just captured, you know, just really captured their life very beautifully um, with just dedication and intimacy. Um, so if you just want to flick through, I've just kind of got a few more things that um, yeah, that I just kind of I go to. So I listen to a lot of podcasts um, and um, there's a few other things I think I might have removed from this, which were a few films and things like that. Um, but ultimately, um, other projects that also interest me is anything that kind of blends psychology. Um, so there's just a few examples here um, and they're just of artists that are kind of just curiously exploring you know they just they just want to know so for example um this work i'm just going to get her name up if i've got it here it's going to be really bad of me if i don't um but she did a project called the crying glasses um and um hayley newman and um, she sat on the subway and she had these glasses that were crying and she looked at how people responded. And just the idea again of, of starting that conversation about empathy um, was really important to me. Um, if you haven't seen this, it's a wonderful project called The And Project. Um, and it's an exploration of, of human relationships. In particular, it focuses on couples confronting truth and asking each other questions um, in quite an interrogating setting. But um, what I love is is just how the raw, true emotion um, is displayed in such a simple manner. So it's called uh, the and.us. It's really worth looking at. Um, a very old school one is Bettina von Swell. And what I love about this work is when I first came across it, for me, I was um, at the beginning when I first discovered photography about 15 years ago, I was absolutely addicted to, you know, James Nashway and, and you know, just photojournalism. I wasn't really kind of, um, yeah, and, and and then I saw this work and I realized the power of of photography can be so subtle in other ways. And it's all about the relationship um, that that person is having within that moment with being photographed. And what I loved about these images is how I disregarded them at first. And then I got closer and I saw some people were crying or they were quite emotional and I realized they were taken in the dark and the subjects were listening to incredibly powerful music. And then there was a flash and the image was taken. And for me, I, I remember Donna saying that she, I mean, it terrified me to ever stay with you, Donna, but uh, the fact that you love photographing people asleep or, or you love those kind of, those moments of, of capturing raw emotion. And, um, and I think that that's what was really beautiful about these images for me was that idea of, you know, that internal just being kind of exposed in a really wonderful way. Um, I think, is there any more? Um, and then I was just going to show some other work if we had time, but I'm going to leave it there because I don't want to hog it. Um, and I've got lots of questions for Donna as well, so I'm sure lots of people have. But thank you for having me again and sorry if I ranted. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Laura, for, for sharing this work with you and also your inspirations and how they, um, uh, how, yeah, how, how they, uh, other photographers influenced your work. I think that's wonderful to see as well. Um, so I think one I, I would like to start us off as a conversation uh, between uh, you and Donna um, and, and talk a little bit more about this importance of care, empathy, love uh, that is so obvious in both of your books, uh, that absolute um, de dedication that you have to the people uh, that you are photographing and you're interacting with. And I'm particularly interested in how you deal with the vulnerability of, uh, um, of these people, because you ask them to be incredibly vulnerable in front of you. Um, how do you kind of put people back together again after they've opened themselves up um, to, to, to be with you in such a in such a way and how do you make sure that they are okay with their image being seen um, when uh, at the most vulnerable so I don't know if we could have a conversation around that uh, don't know who wants to start us off well I think that first of all I don't really publish pictures very quickly after I've taken them I take a long time to put a story together 
after the whole period that I've been with them. Um, I'm not I'm not in a rush ever, and I don't let anybody dictate deadlines to me. As well, I don't put anything out when I think that it could jeopardize their lives. Like, let's say right after a woman has left her abuser, I'm not going to put run to the magazine and say publish this because it's relevant to whatever, you know, you want to you know, like a big seller has often been battered women right now after, let's say, Nicole Brown Simpson was was uh, murdered by by uh, OJ. That became the big, everybody wanted pictures about domestic violence, you know, and they came to me because I was the only one who had these photographs, which were also released. I always get releases from people, and I think that's a really major part of what I do. Um, because the people who sign these releases, they know that I'm going to publish them because it says in the releases, this is a story about swinging or, or relationships or domestic violence or sexual assault. So nobody goes into a kind of decision with me without knowing what it's going to mean that eventually these stories will be published in that meantime before the pictures come out i try to explain to everyone like you were saying you try to be very honest with people laura you know that truth is important to you and i would i am very much that way as well i i i have to be honest i it gets me into a lot of trouble being honest, you know, and I kind of like that, you know, I, because I think that the more honest I am, the more honest the people around me will be. So the the people who are in the pictures know that those pictures are going to, they're going to be seen. And that's why when I'm publishing in a magazine, we work very hard to get all their stories correct, to be able to collaborate, you know everything that they say we need to back it up we need to so i also have fact checkers who work with me on stories when they're published in um in magazines but what i've learned through the years is not a negative it's it's not a negative for any of these people to have me in their life and if it is if they are embarrassed let's say i took a picture 10 years later that gets used in a campaign that makes a woman feel good, bad about it because now her children are older and she can see that. Um, in the past, I've been able to say, okay, if she calls me and says, don't use that picture anymore, I don't use it anymore because, because I don't want her to feel anxious or threatened. I, I really hope that every person in my pictures feels pretty good about themselves because they are representing something that's way stronger than that bad incident where I was a witness to. I mean, I don't just take a picture of, of someone being hurt and then go away and leave them and never see them again. That's not my, that's not my process. My process is to keep going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So we all know each other so well. They come here, they live with me. They live with my daughter. They know I my house used to be like almost a shelter for women and kids and women would come from Europe to stay with me because they couldn't get they knew they couldn't get the kind of protection they needed from a shelter. So so my whole family has become part of this. It's outreach. It's about outreach and it's about using photographs to to connect people more to build more bridges. Um, it's not to, to me, photography is not a precious thing, not at all. I don't even really, especially my domestic violence work. I never really saw this as art and I would get very angry at anybody. I remember Naomi Rosenblum. I love very much. She wanted to put me in this book. She was doing about the whole history of photographers. And I said to her, don't you say I'm an artist in that? And Naomi said, but Donna, you know, this is my book. And if I say you're an artist, I, and I said, don't. And she did. I was so upset with her. 
you know, because I didn't see it because my work is about real life. This is about real life. This is about other people's lives. That wasn't my life. So, so I, but that I, I've switched a little bit now. I'm older and I'm badder than ever. As I keep getting old, I keep getting more bad, more disobedient, more outrageous. And so now I see that photography for me can go into that whole other area that that you're exploring in and having fun with and you know feeling very deeply connected to the world of art and photography and documentary even documentary you can kind of switch it up a little bit and i think that that's sort of i'm 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 more turned on to that right now, really, about how how far we can push this whole thing with the 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 photograph being the document, but how we can go beyond that. As long as we're still true to the story, I don't want bullshit made up things about any of the people in my pictures. And I've threatened to kill people in the past who wanted to use my photographs to make a cool little campaign. Like there was this young guy who came to me 15 years ago and he wanted to make a skateboard with diamond on it, you know, and sort of diamond shouting at his father. And he said, Dan, this is going to be the greatest thing and it's going to go everywhere. And I said, no, you don't have my permission. And he said, no, no, come on, Donna, come on, just do it. It's going to be cool. I said, I will kill you. I will hunt you down and I will kill you. And so you didn't do it, you know, so I, I learned like, you know, you gotta, you gotta get real, you know, and tell people what you're going to do if they fuck with you. I've had photographers take my pictures and put them in museum shows as if they were their own and put their own interpretations that these kids were raped by their fathers or whatever. I go after these people with everything in my arsenal. I don't let anybody screw around with my pictures and ascribe some kind of a different reality to them. You know, no, no, no. But holy is a more complicated thing because I'm, I'm bringing all of these people that I've met for all these years and many of them are very different. Many of them don't agree with me. You know, I'm a, I am totally in favor of choice. There are a lot of women in my book who are against abortion, who think they are, they believe in God, they believe in Catholicism, they're Jewish, whatever. They believe in their way and they believe in the traditions. But they know that I wasn't like that. This didn't come out of the blue, but they probably never expected that it would be this inclusive. Because in Holy, all we're all in, we're all part of it. We're all in the same boat. That's what I'm saying. We can have our differences of opinions and our different lifestyles. And we can, in, we can, you know, be born in one gender and we can switch it over and be the other. And that's great. And we have to embrace each other. We have to embrace each other's desire to have choice and to like control their destiny. That's the very least a human being should be able to do. No tyranny, like I said in the very beginning, I'm going to bring you right back to it, that women have been, you know, tyrannically used and abused and oppressed since the, since the beginning, since man first discovered that by putting his sperm into a woman's body, a baby would come, you know nine months later. I mean, I think that's when, because before that, the women were so powerful because they just spontaneously gave birth. Nobody understood why. It's all about that little drop of sperm that gives men these highfalutin ideas, you know? So I feel like it's time. We really have to address this issue that we have been unequal. We have been giving and giving and giving of ourselves. We go crazy from giving so much and never being good enough and still being called sluts, whores, bitches, cunts, twats, whatever. You know, when we're giving so much, like, you know, where's the respect? Thank you, Donna. Laura, do you want to 
Donna, you're so badass. I love it. <laughs> I don't even fuck with you. <laughs> I'm keeping quiet at the moment. I'm just letting the two of you speak. Everyone's scared. Um, I think I think actually what I was thinking when you asked that question, Kirsten, was um, how we really do um, take on and bear a lot of responsibility when we're working with people. And, um, and I think it's actually all about context. So for some reason, my mind wondered when you first asked the question, I think it was about kind of how do you make sure that, you know, you care for and you look after the people that you're photographing. And I remember and, and one thing that kind of I, I guess is to say is we're human and we all make mistakes and sometimes we're just not going to connect with people and sometimes we're not going to tell the best story or find the best way. Um, but I think for me, like one moment that always sticks in my mind was an editorial where I was visiting a woman and um, and the paper sent me there and they said um, she her daughter was run over by somebody texting at the wheel uh, and driving a lorry and the girl was on her bike and she was dragged under and she was killed. And the mother wants to talk about this to prevent more people texting whilst driving. And it was a magazine spread and they said, oh, um, just photograph her in her dead daughter's bedroom. And I was just like, oh, my goodness, you know, oh, sure. Oh, OK, I'll just pop in and pop out, shall I? Um, and I know they didn't mean that, but it was like, you know, on the way there on the train, I was just trying to put myself in this woman's position. So in the end, the day I went on my own and I, I sat down with her and we, we were just having chats and she was obviously, I mean, it had only happened a few weeks before and she was in a state and, um, and I was just listening to her and I was crying and she was crying. And then she, she just looked at her hands and she, she picked up some sunflower seeds and, um, and I looked at her and she said, you know, I see these fucking things everywhere. And she said, they remind me of my daughter so much because she was studying for her schoolwork and she used to eat these sunflower seeds and throw them on the floor. And even now I pick them up. So the photograph that I took in the end for the editorial was her at the dinner table with a handful of sunflower seeds. And what, for me, that was like, you know, I had to listen to her story and, and not had to, I wanted to listen to her story and I wanted her to, you know, contribute. And, and you know, I went to her and I said, would this be a good idea? You know, would you like to do this? Um, and for me, that that was, you know, a moment when the image begins to start a conversation because you look at the image and you say, I wonder why this person is sitting there with sunflower seeds. And then you go on to read about this tragedy and then it takes you deeper and it just heart wrenchingly, you know, rather than just kind of almost jizzing it all over the page in the front with her, you know, in the daughter's bedroom. I wanted it to, to, to be respectful and subtle. Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, what the responsibility often kind of um, uh, the way to to kind of, I guess, negotiate that is to work with people and try and collaborate with people. And I think I've really learned how to do that in the sense that I think there's been a lot of times where I've turned up and, you know, even now when I'm giving an assignment, sometimes it will just be like, stand there, do this, lights there, that looks good there, that looks good there. And and actually, you know, it is about just stopping and kind of just being in the moment and having a conversation with someone. Um, and I think that when you're given a brief, especially, I mean, you know, on editorials, I'm sometimes I'm, I remember once I was given nine minutes and I had somebody there with a stopwatch. So, you know, you don't always have the luxury of of the pressure being removed. But I think that what I was thinking when Donna was talking is I was going to ask you, Donna, you know, uh, I had a moment recently when I turned around to Devorah, the woman that I'm photographing, and obviously I'm not, you know, presenting her story to fight a cause or, or to tell a story. For me, it's more an exploration of this relationship and, and culture and, and Jewish life. And I said to her, why are you doing this? Why do you why are you letting me do this? You know, and we talked about that and we got it out. And I, I wanted to make sure that, you know, she she was happy, <laughs> you know, after eight years, just checking in, just make, I mean, do you have that conversation with people where, you know, when you've been living with people, when you kind of, uh, or is it just so obvious, you know, or have you had any, any moments where, you know, I don't know, something's happened within that relationship that has really kind of affected you and, and made you realise how special that was? You know, to tell you the truth, I think that the world is made up of two kinds of people. The ones who really get how amazing it is to be with a photographer 
and to have someone who's watching you all the time and really creating something with you, good, bad, whatever. And they're gonna give you some of these pictures. And you, if it, like photographers are the most, like to me, they're sort of like in their own realm of being freaky little gods, you know, because <laughs> what they do is just go around looking, 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 trying to figure out, you know, is that a good picture? Or is that a good picture? And like when we take that picture, that's a good picture because we, Laura Panic says, that's a picture I gotta take. You know, we, when we take that picture, we're doing something beautiful for the people that we're with. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not the person who goes around saying, is this okay for you? Because I think from all of us being together, like a lot of times in a woman's life, it's pretty, boring it's like a routine the same thing every day every day she never goes out you know her man goes out he's there he's there we don't know where you can't ask him what you do today dear i'm working you know and so there she is taking care of 15 kids cooking and cleaning and I, of course she's gonna love you you're like a sister that's how i see it it's like we are we are blessings in the house especially women, especially women. That's such a wonderful way to look at it because I often get asked by people, you know, oh, you know, I'm so frightened of stopping people on the street and, and asking them to take, you know, take their picture. And I said, you're not taking their picture. You are creating something together. This is a wonderful opportunity. You are not wasting anyone's time. No one's, you know, and if anyone says no, which they will, it's just like being in a bar and asking someone out. You've got an opportunity. Would you like to have a drink with me? A lot of people say no, a lot of people say yes. And and I think that, you know, it's really honoring the fact that photography can be a shared gift and a wonderful experience rather than, um, sorry, my friend's room, rather than, um, yeah, taking something. Yeah, we're not taking, we're giving. I mean, does anybody out there who's not a photographer really understand how expensive it is to be a photographer? How much time <laughs> it takes? How much stuff we accumulate? And then all the technology that we have to master, we have to keep growing and evolving. We have to have good cameras. We have to have major mother like hard drives, you know, and then we have to keep looking at them and we have to have rooms where we can store all this stuff and we have to keep looking. We have to keep looking. We have to keep looking outside and inside. And then we carry all these things around like it, you know, we're burdens, we're getting shrinking because of all the heavy booty shit we're seeing all the time. It never leaves us. So people should just understand. But like when we take pictures, we, we are we have a reason. You know, we really do have a reason. And that is we respect every minute of the day that we have. And if we go out in the world and we shoot in the street, it's better that I'm shooting you when I see you in the street, even then even though you're a stranger, then some, all these like thousands of hidden cameras are taking your picture and you don't even see them. That's what I say to people who say, why are you taking my picture? I don't like that. And I say, what are you kidding me? <laughs> you're being photographed like every block that you're on, wherever you go, every toll booth you go through, you're being photographed. At least I'm showing you, I'm more, I'm real. All the other stuff is subversive, but I'm good. I'm good. And so then, you know, you just start a conversation. Just And I think it's about that. It's about intent. And it's if you know that your intentions are, you know, to kind of honor what you're seeing and, you know, honor your curiosity out of respect for what you're seeing, then, you know, I guess maybe we apologize for it and we shy away from asking people because we just feel a bit lucky to be playing with cameras and we're kind of we feel it's kind of like every day, you know, I do wake up and I'm like, this is my job. It's a bit weird, you know, and maybe, yeah, maybe that's the reason that people recoil from kind of getting out there and and asking people. I don't know. It's how you feel inside, Laura. It's how you feel inside. I have never been one to go around apologizing for myself. Yeah. If people don't want to be around me. OK, then I'm not going to see you anymore, but I'm not going to apologize for myself because I, I know who I am. I know why I'm out there or in here and I'm taking pictures all the time. 
is because I just get turned on. And when I see something, my eyes start to vibrate. You know, it's like, <gasps> I get sucked in. It's like a vortex. And then I got to figure out how to compose it, you know, how to make sense of it all. Yeah. And, I, and, and my daughter is like that. My father was like that. Fanny's father was like that. We're all like that. And we're all photographing each other all the time. And if my friends come in, I tell them, bring your cameras in. I get mad at them if <laughs> they don't take pictures. I have a big stick. I smack them. If they <laughs> I get into fights with some of my assistants. Say, no, no, I don't have to take pictures all the time. Uh, only when I feel like it. I say, are you kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me? How come you don't feel like it all the time? Come on. I like, don't. I, I definitely don't. I like. I, I, I used to walk around with a camera around my neck and take pictures every day. And I I have to say now, I really, it, it takes a moment for me to get it out. And actually, I think that's more about lifestyle. If I'm walking around, you know, a new place, I'll always have my camera in my bag. Whereas if I'm, you know, going down the shops or going around my daily life, I would never have a camera on me. And it's weird how 15 years ago I would have done. It was attached to me. Don't it was just... Don't get old. That's all I can tell you. Don't get old. <laughs> but I remember what you what you said really like made me laugh because I remember my dad. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> I remember my, I remember, you know, you're saying how we're weirdos and we just kind of see stuff and we gravitate towards it. I remember as a kid, my dad's a photographer and he used to look at me. And he'd kind of go, yeah, you're about two stops under that side and two stops. And I used to be like, what are you seeing? What is this weird thing that you're that is in your head? And it, I, I then began to see that he was looking at things in shade and light and colour and tone and texture. And that was just his way of seeing the world. And I was like, yeah, that's kind of fun. I want to look at things like that. And I learned that through painting. When I began to paint and draw, I was like, ah, oh, you just separate it into shapes. It's quite a fun little game. Um, but uh, yeah, we are weird, Donna. We are. <laughs> I'm quite You're, weird. You're wonderful. Especially You're wonderful. Women, especially women, for, because I think women photographers are more weird. <laughs> more weird of all, because we're voyeurs, but we're not really voyeurs to like be predators. We are not. It's not, the male gaze has a lot of things to answer for, but the female gaze is something like, I don't know. That's why I feel we have the power to go beyond the superficial. And that's why we have to really keep watching and being out there with our cameras and being very aware. I don't care, even when I go to the supermarket or I go out you know, to the, the wine store to buy a bottle, I just, you know what? I got my camera with me all the time, even in the house. It's still after like 50 years. I am still this camera. My daughter and I, we fight over it now because Fanny is becoming like a terrorist out there in the streets of New York City, too. And I have the greatest camera, you know, it's like an M10. It's like my M4, my M6, that M10 is just so amazing and it just fits. It's like part of my rib cage. It's like I gave birth to that M10. You know, I came with one of my ribs up so I could just keep it right there. You know, I need a strap on. Strap on. Okay, so I'm going to kind of be, it's wonderful to hear you talk, but there, I wanted to kind of have maybe another two questions from the audience, if that's okay. Okay. Um, so Alicia says, um, um, how have you both navigated uh, being makers during the pandemic? And have you found lapses of motivation um, as so many of us have? Um, have you discovered any new photographers, artists in the downtime during COVID? If you had any downtime, don't know who wants to take that one. Uh, I mean, I could start by saying I think at the beginning I went through uh, a stage of feeling like this was, you know, uh, it, I had to make work because this was a one of a kind situation and such an important situation and what an opportunity to be void of any activity but to take pictures. Um, this surely should be a time when the most kind of, 
inspiring and free work comes out. And actually, um, I found I found myself in a complete opposite scale of just a creative block and not being able to produce any images whatsoever. But I've just replaced that with looking at work. I've really been enjoying. I just spent two weeks house sitting and I just went through my friend's bookshelf, shelf by shelf, discovering all these new painters and these new photographers and just immersing myself in how much joy I get from actually looking and learning about work. Um, and also just, you know, learning, you know, about your approach, whether it be sort of mental health and kind of how you're approaching people. But I guess a lot of our work is about relationships and it's about approaching people. And when you can't do that, or when, you know, people are sort of in a different frame of mind than they normally would be, um, I guess, like you said, Donna, we internalize that. So maybe, you know, people might be fine, but we, we might not want to go out, you know, and speak to people because A, we may feel like, Jesus, there's a pandemic going on. There's bigger things to worry about than, you know, just speaking to somebody and taking their picture, you know, or we we kind of write this narrative before it's even written that people are going to be too scared to want to engage with us. Um, so for me, I've, I've really, um, it's really encouraged me to just be more playful and go back to my craft um, and just want to learn more about printing and photography in general um, and just to strip it back to the fundamental elements of photography and remove that pressure, you know, because the only person putting that pressure on me to make work is me. There's no, no one else gives a shit. So um, so I think uh, it's actually been, you know, um, a very non-productive time in some ways, but also a really reflective time in others. Um, what about you, Donna? Well, you know, for me, it was kind of a blessing, COVID-19 was a blessing because I was able to be completely alone in my house. Fanny and Ryan were in Ohio. So it was just me and the cats for about six months. And at that time, I was still in flux with the whole design of the book and pictures. And I had been working on it for three and a half years and I wasn't happy. And it was during that t period that I said to the publisher, Daniel Power, give me, give me another six months and I'll get this done. And because nobody was around, I could keep a big mess, like it just was everywhere and just keep working and thinking and going. But at night, because I'm very, very drawn to the dark side and the loneliness and the empty streets. And, you know, we really didn't know what was going to happen back then, like last February and March. And so I was able to like skulk around like the shadow, you know, skulk around looking you know, for shadows and rats and, you know, any like sign of life in windows that people would see me as they were dancing naked in their window and I'd be out there and they pull their blinds and everything. And I think, what's the matter with you? You're being seen right in COVID naked. But, they, you know, people, but I don't care. I love I love all that stuff. I love I love just being out in the streets. And then as things started changing and we started being able to go out and drink in the streets, but we had to work masks and socially distance. But we felt freer and freer. So I was photographing more in the day. And then Fanny and Ryan came back after, after you know, in the summer. And that started to get more exciting. I don't live with fear. I just can't. I can't be oppressed by anything, not anybody. And the only I, I'm, I, you know, I have to say is that COVID just it sort of I don't know it it did what it was supposed to do, mm. which was to get Donald Trump out of office. <laughs> We just had to somehow get him out. You know, it's a parasite. Silver lining. And so we needed a bigger parasite. Really. And, you know, that's why I think COVID is female. Too. <laughs> so, yeah, you know what? It's all good. I'm so thankful to be alive mm. right now. You know, like this pandemic is is so monstrous and scary to all of us but my parents went through it my parents never stopped saying to me and my two brothers when we were coming out wash your hands right away wash your hands what are you doing you don't get on the floor 
don't be kissing everybody all the time. What's wrong with you? You know, when you go to Europe, you see everybody's kissing each other all the time. So when I, you know, was in my 20s, I started kissing strangers in the streets, you know, homeless And so I had, you know, it was kind of good to bring me back to, you know, being a young girl and listening to my mother. You no, know, we have to wash our hands and we to stop kissing people. We don't really know. We'll be friends. <laughs> Thank you so much, Donna. Um, we have another four minutes in the allotted time that we gave ourselves. So I don't know if there's anything you would like to say. Uh, maybe Ilse, uh, Ilse Frech was asking about the future of photography and where it's going to go. I mean, it's a long, big question, but I was wondering if you want to tackle it. <laughs> so we are so set, really. There are so many incredible photographers out there today, amazing photographers, amazing. Like I'm just in awe of the work that's been done during COVID and what we've seen in the great magazines, you know? I, I'm so impressed and I know that we are unstoppable. The spirit of photography is unstoppable and we will always keep expanding the horizons and doing new things. Even if, even if there's a big blast and cameras are destroyed, we will find ways using uh, like holograms and like creating our own little, what are those rooms that you can create and with a black box like a Diana? We will always find ways to make photographs because we want to, we, we're going at something that, you know, it's a big scene out there. It's almost so distracting with so much. So people who are kind of questioning a lot, they want to simplify things. You know, we want to show little pieces of this and little pieces of that and provoke people to pay attention better. That's all. I mean, I, I see photography as a very provocative act and I don't think that anybody's going to be able to ever stop that. And there are, there are a lot of foundations that are giving big grants out and there's still some great magazines all over the place that are publishing work and photographers are getting more entrepreneurial too and doing very well. And look at the first 10 years of my life as a photographer, I had to work as a nanny and a waitress, you know, on cleaning people's houses. Why not? That's great. We have to do all kinds of odd jobs just so we can get into people's lives and learn. If we're just always, what I think is that if we just are photographers and we don't know any other way to work or make a living, then we will never understand what's going on with all these people out in the world because we will always be different from them. We have to have some commonality with the people that we want to photograph. So I think it's always going to go on. I really think that the spirit of photography is, is, you know, we can sustain it. And can I ask Donna, like um, with like some of your earlier work, I know that obviously some of the couples that you met, like you met them in, in like a swingers bar or different places and you formed those relationships. But I know that some of them came out of like an editorial assignment or a story, if I'm right. So you, you would photograph. Probably all of the stories that I did on domestic violence, those I I initiated it. It wasn't the magazines like hiring me. Sometimes I even had most of the pictures done. Right, but yeah. With with like Philadelphia Inquirer, they, I had just gotten the Philip, the, um, and I never got the Philip Jones Griffiths Award, but that's something that every young photographer should be applying for because it's the greatest award out there right now, except for the Ian e. Perry Award. E. That's Perry. brilliant, cool. yeah. That's brilliant. Um, but so when I got the W. Eugene Smith Award, that, that, you know, sort of put me into a more strong position and that's when magazines started coming to me and asking me to do this work because before I would do this work, but nobody would ever publish it. Mm -hmm. I didn't get it published for three or four years. So when I started to get published, it was because I was suggesting to the magazines, I want to do this, I want to do that. Yeah. And that's how it's always been for me. I don't, I get the access, I meet the people, I find the people, 
I bring along a writer like Claudia Glendowling, who I really trust and I need because we work together so well. And we go out into the world and it's all a discovery. And the magazines never know what they're gonna get with us because we don't illustrate what the magazines want. I don't really give a fuck what a magazine wants. I'm gonna teach them what's going on out in the world. They're not gonna teach me. So I'm not, that's why I don't get a lot of assignments because of, you know, probably a lot of magazines know I'm gonna take my time. They don't even have to pay for it. They just maybe have to pay like the first couple of days and some traveling expenses and all of that at my fee. But after that, I'll invest myself 10 times more because I want to go deeper. Mm -hmm. It's all about access. That's all I care about. And I don't really think that too many media outlets can get me the access that I want. They couldn't get me the access with the police. I had to get that on my own. They couldn't get me the access with shelters. I had to get that on my own. Writing letters, pushing, breaking down doors. I'm like a steamroller. I'm not a little fly in the wall. <laughs> I think nobody would have ever thought that you would be a fly on the wall. <laughs> you are amazing. Both of you are absolutely, absolutely amazing. It was such an honor to have both of you here to speak to us today and I, it must be one of my highlights of the COVID era that I had the, the privilege of having both of you oh. uh, here and speak to you. <laughs> I, uh, it's absolutely, truly such a privilege to hear both of you speak. And I think the energy you both bring to photography, the passion you work with, is such an inspiration and I hope that everybody like me kind of will kind of be lifted today you know in these dreary times of grayness of where every day is the same I think nobody can ever forget the day where Laura and Donna spoke and told <laughs> us what's the what's happening in photography um, so thank you so so much for uh, being here for inspiring us for making our day special. Um, and I hope that one day we can sit in a pub together and yes. actually have a drink after a talk. That would be absolutely, absolutely wonderful. I, I'm look, I'm living for that. Yes. Yeah, 3D, definitely. Okay. That would be absolutely wonderful. <laughs> so thank you very much. And, a uh, and just a very brief thank you as well to the people behind the scenes. Um, Thank you to Chris, John and Sam for doing all the magic button pressing that was going on for the show. Thank you for Duncan for selecting all the questions. I'm super sorry that we couldn't answer more questions, but I think everything we yeah. heard was wonderful. And thank you to Lauren uh, McCarthy as well for doing all the social media, for getting so many people in the room today, um, in the virtual room today. So thank you very much, everybody. And hopefully we see you at the next event. Bye bye. Thank <laughs> you.